you up to a point because as I began to pray and Chris and I were talking about coming out here and man, I had a couple things on my heart and I was like, let's do this, let's do that. And, and it was really, God was saying no to that. And God kept leading me to this scripture because I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I'm going to be very transparent for the guys that know me. You know that well. As I, as I prepared this sermon, this sermon was literally for me. Amen. And so I just want you to know this morning, I don't know if it's for you or not. I hope so. I hope you get something out of it. I just know that, that God literally used this sermon to preach to me. And as I was preparing for this all week, but God really just moved in my heart and my life. And so I want to talk about Peter because we know Peter for a lot of things. But maybe one of the main things we know Peter for is the fact that he denied Jesus three times. Man, I told you he was one of those rot or die guys. I don't know if you had any guys like that. I had a guy like that, um, a guy named Mike. Never forget, it's like my senior year in high school. We were all we were all standing outside, and so when you're standing outside eating lunch, the lunchroom, and there's this guy come up. He played football, and he kind of reached around from behind. He grabbed me, and as he did, he reached in my pocket, and I had like a, a dollar bill, and he pulled it out. He's like, "Thanks for the dollar," and he walked off. Well, my man was a lot bigger than me. Okay, I. I'm 230 now. Back then, I was 110 pounds, okay? So it was all muscle. It was all muscle. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. And gristle. That's right. But I was 110 pounds, and, man, I, you know, everybody was like, what are you going to do? I'm like, it's a dollar. I'm not worried about it. He walked into the cafeteria, and my, my, my boy Mike was like, don't let him disrespect you like that, kid. I'm like, I'm, it's a dollar, man. It's not worth it. He's like, you tell me to go get that dollar back. I'm like, Mike, it's not worth it. No. You tell me to go get that dollar back right now. I'll go get that dollar. I'm like, go get the dollar, Mike. He's like, I got it. Mike walks into the cafeteria, and man, I'm like, this is going to be fun, you know. By that time, door slings open a few minutes later. This guy comes walking out. He's like, you want to fight me for a dollar? <laughs> Mike's like, get him, Kev. I told him he's not going to disrespect you. You go get him right now. I'm like, man, uh, that wasn't what I had in mind, right? Didn't fight him. Didn't fight him. Praise Jesus. Another one of my friends from football took over. He actually ended up making him give me $5. He actually made him pay me interest for it, and it, was, it worked out good. But, but at the moment, I was like, oh, Lord, all right, that's not what I meant. But we got those ride or die friends, right? Those are the guys. We do have some guys, and, and I hope you have that. Matter of fact, in this community, hope you feel like you have that, like you need somebody to yeah. call on, right? I mean, they've become closer than a friend, close like a brother. And I know uh, if you don't have that in your life, I'm a side note, you need that. I've got a guy I know right now that I can call him and I can be as transparent, as real with him as I can anybody else. And he never judges me. Same with him, man. He, when he comes to me, we're straight. I can call him and say, I'm struggling with this, whatever. I hope you have that. Jesus had that. Jesus had 12 guys. I want you to think about this. The son of God comes from heaven to walk on this earth. And he chooses 12 guys, 12 young guys, not the way we, we would choose them. He looks at people differently. And just to give you an idea, if you don't understand the Jewish culture, up until about 12 years old, these guys would have gone through school. They would have tried to learn everything they could. And then at some point, anywhere around 10 to 12, they would have had a decision made for them. Hey, this isn't for you. You better go work in your daddy's trade. And only a few were selected to say, you know what, you're, you're worthy to go on to become a teacher, to become a rabbi, to become a, it's called Talmudim, it's a disciple. And so I want you to understand that every one of the disciples that Jesus chose were rejected. They were rejected by the world. And yet God said, in this time, I'm going to send my son down, I'm going to walk on this earth, and these are the guys that I'm going to choose to do life with. That's pretty incre incredible, and it gives me hope. I hope it gives you hope. But here's the part I want to get to. And we're going to get to this word. And it's just, you might know Peter for this thing, is that when Jesus needed him most, he betrayed him. He let him down, not just once, not twice, but three times. Matter of fact, right before then, remember, right before then he had the conversations like, Jesus, man, I'll die for you. No one's yeah. going to do this for you. Yeah. Then right after that, Judas shows up in the garden. He pulls his sword. He cuts off the ear. Literally, Hours later, he's standing there, and he's denying Jesus in the middle of everything. I don't know if it would have made a difference. Jesus is on trial. He's in a night trial. He's in the, it's, it's behind the scenes. Nobody's actually there. It's not legit. Maybe Peter standing up saying, this is, this is this guy. I am his disciple. Maybe that would have made a difference. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. What it does tell us is that Peter got so upset, he not only 
denied him three times, but the third time he, he bring he brought cusses that he started cussing at folks. I, I don't know that beeping guy. I don't know nothing. And then the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered that Jesus had told him what was going to happen. He said, before the rooster crowed twice, you're going to deny me three times. And I want to pick up because as I read that, man, my heart was like, Phew. I don't know how many of you have been there. You're like, man, maybe I haven't denied Jesus, but we've walked away. I don't know. I'm just being honest. Yeah. I have. Yeah, you do. And there was a time in my life where I felt like, man, it's done. And then I read this passage. And I just want to read this passage to you. Mark 16. I don't have my glasses, so we're going to do the best I can. It said, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on, the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. I would be as well. Don't be alarmed, he says. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. Praise the Lord for that. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And as I read this passage, man, I'm going to be honest to you. Never has two words resonated more in my life than the words when I got to the point that said, go tell the disciples and Peter. And I thought, wow, God, you're so good. Yeah. Here it is, the last thing that happened on Jesus' life on this earth, his best friend, one of his best guys, I mean, ride or die guy, denied him three times. And the first thing you do is have the angel say, make sure you let them know. Oh, and by the way, he called him out by name. It was personal. It was intimate. Hey, go tell the disciples and Peter. God was making a point right there that, Peter, I know what you've done. It doesn't change who you are. And I need you guys to understand that. We've all done stuff. We've all screwed up. I, I, we just have. It's just who we are. But that is not who we are. It's what we've done. And so I want us to understand that. And we're going to look at that in the life of Peter because there's things that happen after that. And I want to point out that fact to you, what Peter did. So I do think it's cool because there's a couple of notes about this. There's one, I love that there were three ladies that went to the tomb and that's who God used. Just so you know, that was absolutely anti-cultural. Jesus kind of, kind of does that, right? He goes against culture. He does his own thing, which I love. I think it's awesome. But I don't think you understand. Back in the day, a woman's testimony would have been worth zero. Matter of fact, this, this is one of my biggest things I use when people say the Bible can't be real. And I go, you're out of your mind. Because if you were writing this thing, if you were actually just trying to write a book to make people buy into it, you would not have written a story that the Son of God rose from the dead and the three first witnesses were women. You would have never chosen that. You wouldn't have said the 12 guys he chose were rejects. Like you would have written a story that made it sound so great, so believable, that all of us would have just jumped into it. But that's not what God did. What God did, he said, man, I do things differently. Remember, what you look at is not what God looks at. He looks at the heart. And so this morning, we're going to talk about Peter just a little bit. And we're going to talk about what happened to get him to an and Peter moment. I want to set the, the scene of what's happened. So, matter of fact, if we flip over to the book of John... John's going to talk about it, which I, I do like John. If you don't know anything about the Apostle John, he and Peter had a little bit of a rivalry. It happens, right? We're guys. doesn't matter if you're walking with Jesus. There's still going to be that I'm better than you type of attitude. And they had that. He and Peter had that back and forth. Matter of fact, the Apostle John's going to write about his account of going to the tomb. And after the ladies tell him, he and Peter take off to the tomb. But when he writes it, he says, Peter and the Apostle whom Jesus loved. Now you got to remember who's writing it. It's John, and he doesn't refer to himself as John. He refers to himself as the apostle Jesus loved. That's pretty funny to me. And he talks about they're running to the tomb, and he says, but the apostle whom Jesus loved got there first. So even writing the gospel, I want you to understand how real this is, that John's like writing this down via the Holy Spirit, pinning this out. He's like, I also just want to put in there I'm faster than Peter. I just want to throw that out there. I'm faster than Peter. 
oh, by the way, Jesus loved me. Like, so, but they get to the tomb. So I want you to understand, Peter actually goes in. And I think it's pretty interesting because they both get there. John makes the point that he beats Peter there. But John doesn't go in. Peter does. Peter walks in the tomb. He's examining everything. And so I want you to understand that Peter's got to his mind that Jesus has, has been raised from the dead. So all of a sudden there's hope. And that's great. So Peter actually goes back. He's with the disciples. They're in one of the rooms. It says the door's closed and Jesus appears. He actually just comes through the wall. He appears to him. So, so Peter has been with Jesus since then. He's seen him. He knows that he's raised from the dead, right? So you think everything's great, but it's not. And here's why. I want to I go back, and, and I don't have my notes, but I want to tell you in Scripture, if you walk through and you go back to the end of John, you're going to see what happens. Jesus is going to go, and he's going to come out to the lake, and the guys are fishing. Peter's out in the boat, which I think is interesting. Because if you remember, when Jesus first found Peter, he was fishing. Right? Matter of fact, Andrew, Peter's brother, brings him to Jesus. But Peter was a fisherman. Remember, Peter was one of those guys who was rejected. And so therefore, he did what his daddy did. He was a fisherman by trade. And now, he knows Jesus has risen from the dead. And Jesus has actually told him at one point. Jesus has walked with him and said, I'm going to change your name from Simon to Peter. Because upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Right, and, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's actually telling that. Because Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples. And he's saying, who, who do people say that I am? And man, they're, they're starting to say, we, they, they feel like you're John the Baptist reincarnated. He was just there. They feel like you're Elijah. You're one of the prophets. They're saying all these things. And Jesus asked a question that I believe he asked every one of us. Mm-hmm. And he says, who do you say that I am? Yeah, who am I to you? That's the question that nobody can answer but you. Mm-hmm. You've got to answer that for yourself. Because who he is will we'll really determine the path that you take in this life. If he's just somebody I can call on when I, when I need something, if he's almost like a, a magic genie that I can rub the bottle when I need something, God, I don't, I don't really want to live for you. I don't really want to obey you. But man, when I'm in trouble, I want to call on you. If that's who he is, that, that's, that's between you. But I just want you to know that that's not what he has for you. He has so much more. A lot of people think, well, following Jesus means I give up everything. No, following Jesus means you get to give up everything. Yeah. That doesn't sound too great. Oh, it does. Because <laughs> I've tried it my way over and over and over, and it sucked. Sorry, I shouldn't probably say that. But it's yeah. just the truth. Yeah, you should. It was hard. My way did not work. Yeah. I did it multiple times. And now that I've just given into him, and, and some of the guys were going through freedom, and we actually talked about this last week, it was the word surrender, right? I've got to get to a point where I give up everything and surrender to him. That's what he chooses. That's what he wants from us. But I want you to hear this. Jesus pulls, pulls Peter aside. Matter of fact, Peter's out in the boat. Jesus says, hey, what are you guys doing? You guys caught anything? They're like, no. He's like, throw it to the right side of the boat. And it says they throw it over and they catch so much fish. like It's like weighing the boat down. But immediately, they're out, they're out there in the boat, and Peter realizes who it is. He's like, wait, it's Jesus. And my man just jumps in the water and swims to it. Like, he just, he just goes to it. But then Jesus is going to have this conversation with Peter. and Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. But he's going to take Peter aside, and he's going to walk with him, and he's talking with him. And he says, Peter, do you love me? He's like, man, yeah, you know I love you. He's like, I want you to feed my sheep. He's like, great. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Okay, I want I want you to, to watch after my lambs. And then it says the third time Jesus asked him, Peter. He actually refers to him, Simon, son of John. And that's key because he, he calls him what he called him before he changed his name. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And said so Peter got upset about it. He's like, man, this is the third time you're asking me. But he makes a declaration this time that he didn't the first two times. He says, Lord, you know all things. So you know that I love you. Jesus says, follow me. And I thought it was very key because I was reading this and I was like, man, here's the passage where they go to the tomb and and God's making sure, hey, let's go tell the disciples and Peter. He doesn't forget him. It's very personal. It's very intimate. Hey, Peter. I know what you've done. It's not who you are. 
And then he comes back and he pulls Peter aside. And see, Peter was fine at that point. I believe in all my heart that was repentance. I believe Peter was good in good standing with God. There was, matter of fact, there was another disciple you might have heard of named Judas. And if you follow Judas and Peter, their paths are very similar. They're actually very parallel. What they both did, they both denied him. They both turned on him. They both gave up on Jesus. However, one becomes the foundation of the church of which God builds upon, and the other one is just simply known as the betrayer. And the difference in between is what I want to talk about this morning. I want to make sure we understand. The difference is what happened after they messed up, because we all mess up. So what happens from that moment? What do we do? How do we go from making sure we're not the guy who goes and throws the silver back and goes and hangs himself to the guy who says, okay, now I'm the and Peter moment. God still wants to use me in my life. And I think it's great because what Jesus does is, hey, Peter, you're in good standing. You're great. You're saved. Man, you're still good. You're going to heaven when you die. I, I, I think, I really do believe that was what was done with the Ann Peter moment. But then there becomes a choice for Peter after that. And this is what I want to focus on. It's the choice is when Jesus pulls him aside and he walks back through those three things. Maybe it's three times because Peter denied him three times. Maybe that's what he did. I don't know. It doesn't really say clearly. Maybe Jesus is like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you up three times just to kind of make up for those three times you denied me. But the key is he asked him if you love me. And in the Greek, Jesus is actually asking him agape. He's asking, do you love me more than anything? Do you love me unconditionally? And actually, if you go read it, Peter never answers him that way. I thought it was interesting. He was like, man, I love you like a brother. He never got to that level. The last time, it was pretty cool. Jesus actually comes down to his level, which is really cool. Jesus comes down the last time and says, okay, do you love me like that? Do you, do you, I'm going to meet you at your level. But here's the key. Here's what Jesus did. He said, not only am I going to forgive you and save you, but Peter, I want to remind you of your calling. You see, it wasn't enough that Jesus said, hey, look, I forgive you. And of course, you're in good standing with me. But what Jesus wanted him to know is, man, what I called upon your life, when I made you Peter and I told you you were going to be the rock, that hasn't changed because of your stupidity. That's one of the best things that's ever been told to me, I'll be honest with you, is, is, man, when God called you, he factored in your stupidity. And I thought, thank you, thank you, Lord, because I got plenty of it. I've screwed up so much. But I'm like, man, it actually was like, thank you, God. Like, you knew I was going to be stupid before you ever called me. Like, if you know all things, you know this. You know my path. You know what I've done. You know how I've messed up. But it didn't change who you called me to be. And that's what I want you guys to understand this morning. I don't care where you are. I don't care where you've been. All I care about is where are you now? Where are you walking now? And, and do you understand that Jesus has a call on your life? And you have to choose, one, who, who is he to you? I hope he's more than the genie. I hope he's actually your Lord and your Savior. So we're going to talk about three things real quick, if I can remember. There are three A's. Oh, man, I had three points, three A's and everything. I'm not used to doing this. But yeah. God gave it to me the first thing. I want to talk about three ways that we can make sure we know that we're like Peter, not like Judas, right? The differences. <laughs> And the difference, the first thing Peter did was he acknowledged. He acknowledged that Jesus was Lord. This is key. Whether you've never done this before in your life or whether you've, you've been saved your whole life and you've gone away from it, what you have to do first is acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. The Bible is clear that salvation comes from first. You have to acknowledge that he is Lord, then it's Savior. A lot of people say, man, I want the Savior part, right? Hey, tell me I can go to heaven and I don't have to go to hell. I'm, I'm down with that. Hey, you know, do you want to go to heaven or hell? Of course I want to go to heaven. All right, well, just ask Jesus to be your Savior. And that sounds great, but I'm going to be honest with you. It's not really scriptural. The Bible is clear that first thing you have to do is you have to make him Lord. What does that mean? I have to submit to what he wants. Now my life becomes his. It's not mine anymore. I have to understand that he is the ultimate authority, not what I want. Matter of fact, the Bible is clear that, that the word of God this is what it refers to Jesus a lot as being the Word, right? John says that the Word was with God. The Word was God in the beginning. Like everything that was created was created through Him. And so Jesus being the Word, we have to understand if we're going to make Him Lord, first thing we have to do is we have to admit that we're not Lord. We have to admit that we're not in charge, that our ways are not the best ways. 
And we have to understand that we have to put him first. We have to let him lead our life. And that's what Peter does. I think it's real interesting that Peter goes back to that. The first two times he answers Jesus is simply, you know I love you. You know I love you. And then the last time, if you go read it, he says, Lord, you know all things. What does he do at that point? He, he exalts him back up. You know what? Man, I'm going about this wrong. Of course you know I love you, but God, you, Jesus, you know everything. Because you are Lord of all things. It's the name above all names, right? It, there is no name given to man to which somebody can be saved. Matter of fact, it says it's the greatest name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. I love that it says on the earth, below it, above it. You realize that the name of Jesus, I almost get this picture like when we say the name of Jesus, like all of heaven just bows. They get back up. Right? But not only that, the demons bow. The enemy bows. You see, a lot of you are going through something. You might be in some tough times, man. You might be in a spot to where you feel like, yeah, this sounds great, but man, you don't understand. When I'm in this moment, and, and I just feel like I'm overwhelmed, and I can't get out of my head. I can't get out of my desire. I can't get out of what I want. Well, the key is simply make him Lord. Exalt his name. What do you mean? I mean, like, I'm just being real with you. Like, when I fall in one of those moments, when I fall in one of those times where I am, I feel like I'm just, man, I can't get out of it. And, and I just have certain desires. I literally have to start speaking the name of Jesus out loud. You're like, man, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at home or, or wherever I am. I'm just going to be like, Jesus, I'm going to start speaking the name of Jesus because the Bible is clear that at the name of Jesus, everything has to bow. My selfishness, my pride, my desire, my lust, my envy, everything has to bow at the name of Jesus. It can't stand in his presence. And then what do I have to do, man? When I'm really struggling, i got to worship. What we just did, how we just started that off, that right there is going to do it. Matter of fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, King Saul, man, once he once he made some mistakes, which there's another parallel, Saul and David honestly did the same thing. One repented, one didn't. It's a whole different thing. But Saul, he said he was kind of overwhelmed by the spirit. He, he would have the spirit on him because he would be so angry. And the only thing that would calm him was worship. He actually had David come in and play <laughs> and sing. And the, he said that when the worship happened, the spirit would leave him. And so I want you to understand, guys, whatever you're going through, whenever you're in those situations, you've got to make sure that you're doing the things that God's equipped you to do, right? To speak the name of Jesus, get some worship. You can't worry. You can't go, you can't go after your desires when you're worshiping, right? Because you're entering in the presence of a holy God. And so the first thing Peter did was he acknowledged who Jesus was. He acknowledged that he was Lord, right? But then the second thing he did was he accepted his call again. Matter of fact, when Jesus takes him back, he's going to tell him. Remember, so he go, he walks him through. Hey, make sure you feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed my lambs. He uses different verbs, but it's the same thing, right? He uses it, but it's the same thing. He's basically telling him, listen, I know you love me now, but here's your call again. Right? Your call stays the same. I called you to go be fishers of men. Remember, he tells him. Are you fishing for that? I'm going to make you fishers of men. So he acknowledges his he acknowledges the Lord, but then he accepts his call again. And his call when Jesus says, follow me. This is what I want you to do. And I want you to know, man, and this is pretty cool. I don't know what call you have on your life. And I know we've had these discussions in group. Like, what does it mean to be anointed? What does it mean to be called? And I'm telling you that every one of you, when you accept Jesus, you have a call on your life. Jesus was very clear. Matter of fact, you see this multiple times throughout the Gospels. Is Jesus says what we call the Great Commission, which is go and make disciples. That's your call. All of us have the same call when it comes to that, is to make disciples. Now, God will use you in his own way, and you're gifting to do those things, right? But every one of us, and I've told the, told the guys I'm telling you the same, wherever you are, God wants to use you in that place to reach somebody. There might be somebody that will never step foot in a church. They'll never step foot anywhere else. But, man, they'll listen to your testimony. They'll hear how God took you and pulled you up out of the miry clay, out of that, that pit, and he set you up on a rock. And, man, he's using you, and he's loved, he loves you, and he hasn't forsaken you. And they'll, he'll use that to reach somebody that would never, ever be reached before. So that's your calling. 
So the key today is you're going to accept him as Lord. And are you going to, I mean, acknowledge him as Lord. And are you going to accept your calling that he has on your life? Because every one of you have a calling. But you got to accept that. All right, and then the last thing is very simple. Once you acknowledge Him as Lord, once you accept the calling, you got to actually act on it. What does that mean? Well, if you go, okay, I accept my calling, but then you sit here and you never actually do anything, you haven't accepted it, you haven't acted upon it, right? You've got to do something. You got to get up and do whatever God's called you to do. Peter did that. If you fast forward to the book of Acts, in the second chapter, so the same Peter that cowered down when Jesus was on trial and was too afraid to admit who he was, all of a sudden in the book of Acts, I believe some of the same people that were there when Jesus was crucified are there in this crowd, this huge crowd, and the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and it says they're speaking in tongues, and the people are actually going, are you guys drunk? And I, I love Peter's response. I, I love the Bible. If you don't read the Bible and you think the Bible's boring, I got, you just got to read it different, okay? Because when you go read Acts, Peter's response is, what do you mean we're drunk? It's only 9 in the morning. I know some guys that that wouldn't necessarily apply to, okay? I know some guys like 9 o'clock in the morning wouldn't be a big deal, but that was Peter's response. Dude, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Of course we're not drunk. But then Peter, what he does next is pretty amazing. The same Peter who cowered behind and denied Jesus three times stands up in front of some of the same people, and I'm talking about with boldness, preaches who Jesus was. No, no, no. Let me tell you what you guys, this is who Jesus is. He goes through... He just simply quotes the word of God and he starts to share with them, this Jesus, this is the Jesus you rejected. This is the Jesus you crucified. But guess what? We're here to testify that that Jesus has been raised from the dead and he sits at the right hand of God. And the Bible says that, that 3,000, about 3,000 men came to know Jesus that day. Wow. Man, if you ever preach a sermon with 3,000 people, that's going to feel getting saved. That's pretty awesome, right? But Peter did that. It's the same Peter. So what changed in between? <coughs> well, what if Peter had done, this is being honest, what I, I have done. See, God had a call in my life early on. And then I, I was living in it, and then I screwed up. And then I was like, I found myself in a spot going, well, that's done. I've messed up my life. I, 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 man, I'm fine. I, I got back in right standing with you. I repented. You've forgiven me for my sin. And I'm good with that, God. I'm, I'm so just so thankful that you forgive me. And God's like, well, what do I still have a call in your life? And I'm like, no, not anymore. I, I, I've messed it up too far. And God's like, no, no, no. And what if Peter had done that? What if Peter just said, listen, that's great. I know what you want me to do, God, but I'm just still too ashamed of my past. I'm still living in who, who the enemy is going to tell me I was because of what I did. And that's what we got to understand this morning. It's not what you did is what you did. It's not who you are. And I don't know. I don't know any of us. I'm saying all of us have messed up, right? You, you say yes to that? I'm your dad still. I'm watching. <laughs> all of us have messed up. We've all made mistakes. But you cannot let that define you. You have to listen to what God says about you, right? And God's clear that he formed you. He made you in purpose. I love Ephesians, right? It says you are... The cra God's craftsmanship, that word handy or uh, masterpiece is what it actually relates to. You are God's masterpiece, meaning he didn't just go, he spoke things into being. I love that he spoke everything into being, spoke the world, the stars, all that we see, but he formed man. He, he took the time to, to form you. And so... When you were in your mother's womb, he formed you together. He made you. And Ephesians actually says you were created to do good works that were before the foundation of the earth was laid. Before God even created anything else, he had something in mind. So I need you to understand, he didn't create you and then go, what am I going to do with you? He created you to do something. And so the call this morning is simple. All of us are in some place. We're in one of these places, right? We're either in a spot where we need to acknowledge him as Lord. That might be the first time we've ever done that. It might be where we've, kept, we've got off track. You just need to come back. Come back like Peter did. Just acknowledge him as Lord. Lord, I just I come back to you. I repent for what I did. Meaning I'm turning around. By the way, repenting is not just saying sorry. Repenting means I'm walking this way and I go, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go a different way, God. I'm not going to try my way anymore. Are you still going to fall? It happens. We, we still mess up. We're perfect. Peter would do the same. He would still have some issues. 
but it's every time, okay? Nope, going back this way. God, I'm turning back to you. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping you as my, my focal point. This is the way I'm walking towards you. And so that might be where you are this morning. You have to acknowledge that. Some of you in this room have done that, but you got to accept your calling. Some of you are just fine just to skate through going, hey, I got heaven. I'm good to go. And you go, well, Kevin, I don't know what my call is. I don't know how to use it. I told you to make disciples. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Maybe some of you are just supposed to step out here when you go to work and be the best employee you can have. Start there. Be the best employee you can be. Yeah, but you don't know my boss. It doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Oh, but man, you don't know how I get treated. It doesn't matter. Jesus was spit on and crucified by the very creation that he made. Mm. And yet he loved them and he forgave them. Yes. So my challenge to you, how about you step out onto your job site today, whatever you're doing, and you say, okay, I'm just going to be the best example of Jesus that I can be today. That's, that's an answer to your call right there. Some of you have a deep call. Some of you have a call to ministry on your life. I know you were telling me the story. You said it was like five or six of you guys in prison that would get up every morning and go meet and pray. And like every one of you are now in ministry. And I can only imagine in those days when you're actually incarcerated, you're like, I don't know if you could ever see that, but God did. I don't know if you could, I don't know if y'all ever had the vision, man, one day all of us are going to be leading ministry and doing ministry, but God did. That's the God we serve. He already sees that. And so some of us just need to step into our call today. That's our thing. We need to accept it. And maybe... Some of the rest of us, me included, just need to continue to act upon the call that we have, right? We need to be that example for everybody else. We need to make sure we're doing those things. And so I just want you to know I love you. I'm proud of you. Thank you so much for letting us be here today. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to sing one more song, if that's okay. I don't know what time it is. Make sure we're good. We're good. we got two minutes. <laughs> Real quick. We might not have time. We'll just pray today. But I do want you to know I love you. I'm praying for you, and thank you for who you are. Let's pray. God. Thank, Thank you, you so Jesus. much for who Thank you are. You for I pray this morning, Father, I just pray you use Lord, this word and that you would just penetrate the hearts of your That's people. Right, and I know you did me. You and so, God, for those in this room this morning, just need to acknowledge you as Lord. I pray that they would just give you their life today, God. Just give it back to you. Give you full control. Surrender to you. God, those that just need to accept the call they have on their life, Father, just, just allow us to do that. And, Father, just we, we want to act upon it and allow you to lead our lives. So, God, we give it to you now. Take this day. Just use it for your glory. Use us. Lead us where you'd have us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. I wonder if I planned this whole thing. I did not. I did not plan it. I couldn't have made it up if I tried. That's the way it works. That's the way it works.